and so I feel that somehow uh, Goethe is the originator of this uh, discourse of, of, of world literature. This is not exactly the case. It is true that Goethe begins to understand world literature uh, in, a, in a different way as interested in the networks of interaction between writers and readers and translators. And this is a very important point to make. But the mainstream thinking of world literature that um, proceeds under the banner uh, of, 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 of these two uh, understandings predates uh, Goethe and proves very influential throughout this, the life of, of this um, project. A third meaning, which is very familiar to uh, us all, and which, just as the other two, continues to shape the way we uh, think about world literature and often the way we teach uh, world uh, uh, literature. Um, uh, these three uh, meanings um, uh, often um, uh, live in implication and, and overlap. Um, the canon is a notion uh, gradually attached to world literature precisely because it is only the best writing that is thought of as capable of cultivating these um, uh, qualities of uh, erudition and, and sociability. And finally, and I'm very selective, a fourth meaning which, unlike these three, is a meaning that cannot be attested in the writings of uh, intellectuals or, or writers or commentators. In a sense, this is the, how I would imagine uh, world literature um, and how I would um, uh, picture the, 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 the need to, to go beyond the current um, discourse. That is dynamizing the notion of world literature, going beyond this secondary reification which we're still suffering from in uh, the numerous anthologies that we produce in the piecemeal fashion in which we teach world literature, and ultimately in this fetishization of cultural difference and variety, which of course also has its uh, strengths, but does contribute crucially to a static notion of, of world uh, literature, where the objects are fixed very much in the way they would be in this favorite piece of furniture in the 18th century, the curiosity cabinet. You would pull a drawer, you would take out the object, you would uh, marvel uh, at it lovingly, and then you would safely put the drawer back. There no notion of contact, interaction, least of all tension, would arise from this procedure of admiration. Um, I will um, get back to, to these meanings as this uh, talk uh, uh, progresses. Um, but now I wish to uh, begin by giving you some sense of how um, the Soviet interest um, in and engagement with uh, world literature progressed purely chronologically, and how it was embedded in uh, an infrastructure of uh, intellectual uh, life and creative writing. And uh, I wish to begin by saying uh, only a few words about uh, the truly pioneering project straight after the October Revolution of 1917, um, by Gorky, initiated by Gorky, um, who envisaged and built this enormous, uh, by the standards of that time, particularly if you consider that this was a Russia ravished by civil war and, and hunger, publishing house called uh, World Literature, uh, whose purpose was very clear to deliver to uh, the reading public of the previously disenfranchised um, classes, 
and brought in names of them very clearly the workers, the peasants, and the soldiers returning from the front. The masterpieces of literature, regardless of whether they come from the West or from the East, and I will return to this point later on. So Gorky's project is very much shot through by these um, cardinal and very resilient uh, meanings uh, by which we tend to make sense of world literature, um, cultural variety, um, um, the educational core of world literature, which should give access to these uh, underprivileged uh, classes to the best that has been said and thought in a very Arnoldian fashion and would thus cultivate them into better human beings. And finally, of course, the uh, vision of world literature as a canon. Um, Masha Kortimsky has written uh, persuasively and in great detail on the history of this publishing house. One feature that I wish to mention here very specifically is the fact that uh, Gorky imagined this infrastructure not solely as a publishing house that would do all this work of translation and, and, and commentaries and would deliver these books in cheap editions uh, on, on the market. Simultaneously, and as part of this uh, project, Gorky also established uh, in Petrograd a translator's studio and a studio that was dealing with questions of literary theory. And who would be invited there? The best translators Russia had uh, at, uh, at the time amongst them, Kornei Tchaikovsky, known for his uh, translations even before the revolution of Walt Whitman, and others. But crucially, also some of the Russian formalists notably um, Shklovsky and uh, Eichenbaum. And what we read in Shklovsky's theory of prose, his engagement with uh, Stern and with Don Quixote, begins live as lectures he would give in these two studios. Now, why is this an important point? It is an important point because we tend to forget, and this is uh, true of Russian theory as much as it is uh, of Western theory, that uh, theory begins life not as a uh, disembodied um, uh, set of statements on literature. Theory actually begins uh, life as an embodied and involved project politically, but also through this symbiosis with creative writing. And the first textbook of literary theory published in uh, Soviet Russia uh, Leonid uh, Timofeev's uh, uh, literary theory of 1934 is actually uh, meant and conceived and written as a help book for writers. Um, this has implications for how we understand theory, which we are only, I think, now beginning to realize that we should think uh, about. Um, I will return to this project later on in the talk from uh, a different perspective. But for now, let me say a few words about this uh, institutional mainstay of the Soviet engagement uh, with world literature, the famous Institute of uh, World uh, Literature. Now, this institute uh, has a very um, telling institutional history. Uh, established in 32 and immediately upon its uh, foundation named after Gorky, who was still alive at the time. And historians um, tend to agree, yes, 1932. Was it, wouldn't the name established after his death? No. No, it was established um, following a decree to commemorate his anniversary and as a response to that in his vestia, Tsik, published a special resolution that a literary institute named after Gorky should be established. So Gorky received this gift 
uh, historians tend to think actually a bribe from Stalin <laughs> to toe the line. Uh, but at its establishment in 32, um, the institute was called the Literary Institute Maxim Gorky. There was no mention of world literature in its title. Um, in 1934, the institute was renamed the Institute of Literature Maxim Gorky. And this is already a considerable shift. The first title still reflects the power struggles between those who believe that this should be an institute that should be educating creative writers rather than a research institute. Um, hence the name the Literary Institute of Maxim Gorky. In 30, by 34, those who believe that this should be a proper research uh, institute had the upper hand and the institute was renamed. But it was only in 38 that the institute was included in the network of institutes of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Before that, for six years, it was an independent institute. And at that point, it acquired its present name, the Institute of World Literature. Um, now, um, this has everything to do with what was taking place in the Soviet Union during that uh, uh, decade. And um, I will come to say a few words about this later in uh, the talk. But uh, Katerina Quark, who has written a, a wonderful book on cosmopolit cosmopolitanism in, in Soviet literature, uh, has written persuasively about the major shifts that occur at the time of opening of the Soviet Union towards the West and the increased uh, preparedness uh, by the Soviet Union to work with wider circles in the West that are not necessarily um, left-oriented in the narrow sense of, of the word. So um, the renaming uh, Institute of World Literature, Maxim Gorky, reflected very much this process, the process of the Soviet Union beginning to articulate its own version of, of world literature and beginning to behave in terms of scholarship but also in terms of cultural diplomacy as the uh, center of this new vision of world literature. Finally, um, I wish to say just a few words about this extraordinary monument of not just Soviet scholarship, uh, but also uh, uh, Soviet ideological uh, engagement with world literature. Uh, and this is a, the famous eight-volume history of, of world literature, which was initially conceived as a ten-volume edition. Uh, volume nine uh, was written, but um, after um, um, Pierre Stryker, uh, it, it, it was an untenable proposition, so it was shelved and never published, and thus the project actually assumed this form of an eight-volume um, edition. Um, why is this project so uh, important? It is really important because for the first time, um, world literature here in a very focused and sustained manner is thought of and its history is constructed and narrated uh, from a non-Eurocentric perspective. Now, a Danish scholar has gone to the trouble of statistically calculating the a space assigned to the discussion of non-Western literatures in the Soviet project compared to mainstream histories of world literature from the early uh, 20th century into the 1960s uh, in the West and has 
are proven uh, beyond doubt with statistic precision that the Soviet project in that sense is far more serious and, and far more adamant that non-Western literatures should be treated as co-evil. Uh, and, and this is really, uh, I think, the, the uh, lasting contribution of uh, this project. The other lasting contribution of this project, and I will come to talk about this when I briefly discuss the work of Nikolai Konrad, is that at least early on, when it comes to world literature in, broadly speaking, the pre-modern uh, age, it really, really rose back against this static notion of world literature, which considers world literature as the conglomerate, rather disparate, uh, conglomerate of isolated uh, national literatures that do not come to interact with one uh, another. Uh, at least the first three volumes of this history uh, pursue a very different agenda. And they're genuinely interested in delivering the methodological or, or a set of possible methodological uh, principles that would allow us to narrate the history of world uh, literature as a form of asymmetric interaction, as I tend to call it, between different cultural zones. What is interesting about this uh, project is I recently uh, discovered I was reading a um, uh, uh, Russian-Soviet um, sinologist and Indologist, uh, Boris Ripton, and his contribution to a major volume on uh, the typology of world literature published in 1974. And I was surprised to see in Rifton's contribution to this volume that clearly a prototype of volume one existed as early as 1973. And he discusses the, the uh, chapters of, of that volume. What took the Russians so long? Good 10 years between 73, when volume one existed as a, as a uh, prototype, uh, and 83, when it was officially delivered. This was a strategic project. This was a prestige project for the Soviet humanities. I doubt this was a question of resources. I rather think uh, the huge delays, the huge distance between 73 and 83 has everything to do with the struggle inside this uh, huge project over its methodological principles, uh, which only means that the Russians were actually taking this very seriously. And, and of course, there were different uh, views on how this uh, history uh, should be uh, uh, told, but clearly the view that one should not any longer afford to tell it in the old, slightly encyclopedistic and static way, that view prevailed. Let me talk a little bit about what unites <coughs> all these uh, different projects. Um, uh, first, Gorky's, then uh, Imli's, and all the way uh, through to this uh, monumental history. Um, and I want now to spell out the shifting ideological backgrounds that underpin uh, this uh, uh, sustained Soviet engagement with world literature. The first uh, horizon that I identify is what I call the humanist notion of world literature, which has everything to do with the first of the first three of the four meanings that I went through in the first part of, of this talk. Now, this humanist notion is very characteristic of Gorky's world literature uh, uh, project, and it actually continues also uh, when uh, Gorky uh, leaves um, temporarily, as it will turn out, um, the Soviet uh, Union. Um, 
and uh, establishes this um, literary journal in emigration in Berlin called um, The Conversation, uh, which is indeed sustained by a very uh, humanist notion of world literature, where world literature is seen as a, a educational vehicle, and where, liter and where world literature is actually also seen as in being in need of a certain depoliticization. And, and what Gorky is trying to do in Beseda, in the conversation, is to bring together writers and intellectuals from different parts, sometimes the opposite uh, parts of the uh, uh, political spectrum. The left, just as much as, as the conservative right, notably, he was proactively seeking Spengler's collaboration for this uh, uh, magazine. Now, the great paradox of, of this type of involvement with world literature, the, the humanist notion of world literature, in the case of Gorky, um, and this is particularly visible with his uh, publishing project of world literature, is that it comes in response to political and social upheaval on a scale not seen before that, the October Revolution, which cries out for radical change and which cries out for supporting this uh, radicalism um, in, a, in a committed fashion. And what does Gorky do? He supports a revolution in every sense in every meaning of that word, with a conservative uh, invocation of the canon. He supports the communist revolution with Arnoldian means. And uh, uh, revolution and conservatism here really abide together in this very tense and unresolved relationship. And, uh, this is really the, the undercurrent of this humanist notion, which is never too far from a conservative version of world literature, which relies on an inherited canon, which merely now needs to be brought to a larger reading public, but not in itself questioned or replaced. Now, there is also the, the, this very important left horizon uh, of the Soviet engagement with world literature, which uh, really runs through the 1920s and the 1930s, um, initially based on a very stark class principle, but then gradually being, for some diluted, uh, for uh, others uh, uh, nuanced, uh, in a way that recognizes a broader democratic and anti-fascist uh, uh, spectrum and helps, in, in the words of uh, Michael David Fox, this uh, exercise of showcasing the Soviet uh, experience. Now, um, when uh, this agenda begins to be articulated in the 1920s, and later on in the 1930s, um, it ends up with an ever-growing string of visitors to Soviet uh, Russia from the uh, European uh, West, but also from the United States, less so from China and, and other uh, places. Some of uh, these visitors um, go back and they produce uh, the books that are expected of them and for which they uh, would be uh, handsomely remunerated <coughs> even while still in the Soviet Union. Others, of course, as we know from André Gide's example, would um, prefer to um, uh, speak publicly about their disapproval of uh, Soviet reality as they uh, saw it. But what is important to keep in mind for now is that this second left 
um, ideological horizon is very uh, much active and at work throughout the 20s and the 30s, and not since, not since to that extent, and not since with the same weight and significance in the Soviet context. Now, there is a third horizon, not identical with any of the uh, preceding two ideological horizons or backgrounds, what we can call the anti-colonial notion of world literature, and uh, Rosen Jagolo's forthcoming uh, book is, is, is a real contribution to studying uh, this particular notion of, of world literature. Um, in the Soviet case, uh, this uh, particular horizon becomes dominant since the early 1960s uh, as a response to the formation of the non-allied uh, movement. And you see a number of institutions, educational and research institutions, that late in the 50s and early in the 1960s began to uh, spring uh, up on the institutional map of Soviet education and science. Notably, the Soviets, who would have an institute um, studying just about any branch of science imaginable, didn't have an institute of African studies until 1959. Um, and here is an example of an educational institution, the um, um, a University of People's uh, Friendship, established in 1960, and in 61, suitably uh, renamed to honor a major fighter against colonialism, Patrice Lumumba. Now, the question is, what does really unite these three very different ideological uh, backgrounds? The uh, humanist, the, the leftist um, class, and then uh, anti-fascist, and finally the, um, the uh, anti-colonial one. And uh, I really think that uh, what um, brings them together is this very sustained, non-Eurocentric notion of world literature. It is very clear to begin with in Gorky's project. Gorky really was very adamant that his publishing house should bring out books by writers from China and India and the Middle East, not just by writers in the major European languages. And he created a special editorial committee on Eastern literatures and appointed as its chair the famous uh, Russian endologist, Sergei Oldenburg, whom we'll see in the next uh, slide. Even the second of these three uh, horizons, the class-based left understanding of world literature would articulate this major shift in how the Soviets understood world literature in a sustained non-Eurocentric fashion. In 1922, the journal The New Orient, Novy Vostok, was founded in Moscow and would be published until 1930 as the journal of the uh, Association of Soviet Orientalists. And in the first issue, there is a remarkable editorial in, in, in which one can read the following sentence. Our purpose is to study the literatures and cultures of the oppressed. And wherever they live and write, from Asia to Africa to Latin America, this is the new Orient. This is a, a, a remarkable statement, where uh, the class principle is really articulated by radically expanding the notion of what constitutes an Orient for this new Soviet public and for this uh, new way of approaching uh, world uh, 
uh, literature. Um, and so the geographical principle, the linguistic principle, would matter less than the ability of the uh, Orient to coalesce the energies of every single culture that was being oppressed and that was being seen as dominated by a long uh, uh, tradition of Western discursive and cultural and political power. And of course, in the anti-colonial iteration of world literature, uh, the non-Eurocentric principle uh, was uh, at ample display and very much actively engaged at work. Um, I wish to say now just a few words about um, four thinkers who uh, embody this sustained non-Eurocentric notion of world literature in very different ways. And I will not be assigning equal attention to each one of uh, uh, them. Um, and I begin with um, uh, this um, man, a personal friend of, uh, of Gorky's, and uh, probably the most important Russian Indologist until uh, the 1930s. When the Soviet Academy of Sciences was expanding, uh, in 1933, it finally opened not even a branch yet, but what the Russians would call at the time a base of the Soviet Academy of Sciences in Tajikistan. And the library of the Tajik Academy of Sciences uh, begins life as a huge donation by Oldenburg of his own uh, library of Oriental Studies, about 3,000 uh, volumes. And that library, even before Perestroika in the early 1980s, would be named the Indira Gandhi Library of the Academy of Sciences at Tajikistan. But much more interesting in, in many ways are, um, are, are moving clockwise, are these two uh, men, Nikolai Mar and Mikhail Bakhtin, who would be known to many in this audience. And I really think we have um, every right to claim them for a non-Eurocentric understanding of, of world literature. But what really distinguishes Mar and Bakhtin in this respect is that, uh, particularly Bakhtin, um, his way of being non-Eurocentric is not the extensive spatial widening of what you include in world literature. Uh, his way of de-Europeanizing world literature is a, is a journey not in space, but in time, by actually focusing on pre-European verbal masses, on myth, folklore, rites, epic, the anonymous territory which is not European, just as much as it is anybody uh, else's. And this is a fascinating journey that is performed in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, both in the works of Marx and particularly in, in the work of, of um, Bakhtin. And if you, if you heed Bakhtin's genealogy of the novel, you would know exactly what I uh, mean just as much as his take on uh, Rab Rabelais. So thinking of world literature in a non-Eurocentric way, not in the extensive way of adding non-European examples, um, but thinking in this intensive way that uh, turns its attention to the time before there was articulated European identity and before uh, various national literatures could begin to claim this shared anonymous legacy of myth and folklore. I wish to say now a few words about uh, Nikolai Conrad because uh, he in many ways is the most um, 
heuristically, the most interesting figure involved in this eight-volume um, history of world literature. Now, Nikolai Conrad had the great advantage to be a, a Sinologist and a Japanologist. And he also read Korean and worked in Korean, but uh, the center of his work was uh, Japanese and, and Chinese. And being a Sinologist really gave him the long durée perspective on world literature, which Europeanists, by definition, lack. Because he really had to confront uh, a literary tradition that stretches much further back and then continuously around for several um, thousand um, years. Now, Conrad's response to the question, how do we write the history of world literature, and how do we um, bring dynamism to this traditionally static contemplation of disparate examples of, of, of world literature from different cultural zones, was that of a Marxist, but one who is subtler than uh, orthodoxy would uh, suggest. Now, uh, he believed that, um, yes, you could narrate continuously the history of world literature uh, if you deploy the staple Marxist um, view of, of literature and culture as a stage-like process, where all societies inevitably go through different socioeconomic formations and their respective literatures um, reflect uh, this journey. And particularly important in these journeys were the points of transition, for example, from feudalism to capitalism. Now, he took on board this Marxist dogma of the journey across and through socioeconomic formations, uh, and he focused on one such point of transition, the Renaissance, which of course for uh, those who work on Western European literatures is this very seminal moment, as Engels would describe it, of um, the clash between tradition and innovation at the cusp of feudalism and uh, early capitalism. And as you would recall, uh, Engels has two um, criteria in that regard. Um, uh, one is uh, for, for, for a piece of uh, literature to be a piece of Renaissance literature, it has to engage with tradition in some way, particularly the Greco-Roman one. On the other hand, it has to reflect the nascent early forms of urban life and the transition uh, from uh, forms of uh, production uh, based on uh, uh, agriculture to the uh, urban forms of production and trade. Now, Conrad took all this on board, but he still felt that this would not be specific enough if we were to tell the history of literature rather than just the cultural uh, history of transition. Because he was lacking in all this a specifically aesthetic moment. And so he began to understand the Renaissance as a global aesthetic and ideological phenomenon. And on his uh, account, this global phenomenon, and this is the starting moment, would begin not in Italy in the 13th and the 14th century. It would actually begin in China in the 8th century with the so-called Fugu movement, which began in early Tang and peaked in, in mid-Tang um, uh, dynasty, which many read as a return to Confucianism in a more perhaps rigid and orthodox uh, way. Um, from China, Conrad would claim, Renaissance would travel to uh, Central <coughs> Asia and would settle first in Persia before arriving in 
Italy. So you can see the sweep of this curve of monumental scale, which, uh, when you think of Moretti's work on the travels of the European novel from the European shores to Brazil, uh, you can also think of what uh, Conrad was doing in the 1960s, this global axis of uh, Renaissance literature from China to Persia to uh, Italy. But he would also consider the reverse movement. And in a different aesthetic and ideological formation, what he calls realism, he would um, actually draw the opposite curve. Realism to him, and again, he was a Marxist in many ways, realism begins in Western Europe. Why? Because uh, it is in Western Europe that the contradictions of capitalism are ripe for literature to capture and reflect upon. <coughs> and then this curves takes realism on its global journey to the Middle East and to China and Japan. And so by the 1920s, 1930s, this journey is complete. And actually, uh, from the point of view of literary history, this is all correct. It is true chronologically that this journey, uh, realistic writing performs, moves in that particular fashion. And it is also true that in the process, uh, we witness significant changes in uh, the repertoire of genres, because both um, in China and Japan, and particularly in, in, in the Middle East, in Arabic literatures, the novel is, is actually displaced as the master genre of realist writing by the short story, particularly in, in Arabic uh, literatures. Now, Conrad has been much criticized, particularly by sinologists, for this bold statement of a global uh, renaissance, less so for his opposite curve of, of, of how realism <coughs> becomes a global literary phenomenon. And I do think that his critiques have a point, because in, of course, in the 8th century uh, China, there was uh, uh, no germination of early capitalist forms of production and, and culture. But I think um, we need to understand Conrad on his own terms, and we need to see the seminality of his error which is to say that his master objective was really to envisage world literature as a, uh, as a, uh, as a project in, in which aesthetic forms evolve and, and, and travel in time and in space, and evolve in this uh, journey different cultural zones at different times. Uh, so he goes beyond uh, this, um, I think, fatal version, uh, present this version of world literature as a simultaneous, somehow simultaneously available pool of, of texts, which is so pervasive uh, today. Now, before I end, I would wish to give you um, a very brief uh, account of how thinking about world literature in the Soviet Union uh, was actually also seminal uh, for how Russians began to think of their own literature and, and culture. And just, uh, I just wanted to, before I do that, to go very briefly back to Conrad and say that um, uh, he could have chosen actual examples in the Chinese tradition uh, of direct involvement of the Chinese with the Italian uh, uh, Renaissance. But this would have meant that he should have singled um, for praise uh, people early uh, in, in the 20th century, many of whom uh, were of conservative persuasion politically. Students of Dewey at Columbia or, or of Irving Babbitt in, 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 in Harvard uh, around uh, Tsinghua University, and 
Um, and they would not serve his uh, political agenda, but also would not serve, crucially, his agenda of delivering a message that the Chinese were not involved in the game of imitating or emulating the West, because they were, in a sense, there before the West and in their own way, with their own resource. Now, um, three moments of how thinking about world literature affects the way one thinks about uh, Russian literary theory and Russian literature. Because I think this point is an important one to make, that world literature and national literatures are communicating vessels in, in, in many ways. First one, uh, I've uh, written on this one, uh, uh, but I really want to make this point that um, we tend to think that um, assaults on Russian formalism in the Soviet Union would come from Marxism for ideological reasons. And, and these assaults would be easily refutable and um, dealt with. But the truth of the <coughs> matter is that Russian formalism would be attacked at the end of the 20s and the early 30s from young Orientalists who would uh, actually ask this very important question, how do the formalists claim to have arrived at a literary theory of universal validity given that they don't consider the aesthetic experience of non-European uh, traditions? And there is a brilliant article by Alexander Kovodolich of 1930 who was to become the Soviet expert on Korean literature and culture in which he makes this very pertinent point. How can you establish a literary theory of universal, uh, of a, a claim to universal validity without considering non-European uh, literatures and aesthetic um, experience. Another episode of this pressure, the discourse on world literature was exercising on the discourse on national literature. Many of you here would know that uh, the Russians have um, for a very long time lived, perhaps they still do, I, I wouldn't know, with this trauma <coughs> of not having had their renaissance. <laughs> and uh, when, um, when Conrad published uh, his articles in the 60s, his close friend, the medievalist Dmitry Likachev, uh, uh, his other close friend was uh, Zhermonsky, and they were working on the project of launching a Soviet Journal of Comparative Literature, which never happened. Uh, Likachev began to listen to uh, Conrad's theory, and he suddenly began to publish various works, and he was seeking to carve out what he would call pre-Renaissance phenomena, uh, to trace a pre-Renaissance line in medieval Russian uh, literature. And his opponents sarcastically would, uh, would uh, write back and say, what are these strange pre-Renaissance phenomena of a Renaissance that never takes place? <laughs> um, um, and finally, finally, Again, m many in this room would uh, know that um, for a very long uh, uh, time, um, with very brief uh, uh, pauses in between, um, romanticism in the Soviet Union was considered with a certain suspicion, ideological suspicion. And uh, this all goes back to the founding moment of the first Union of Soviet Writers, 1934, in which Gorky seeks to establish romanticism as a method of conceiving uh, and rendering reality that is absolutely uh, coeval on a par with realism. But he fails. And uh, this is uh, his great uh, failure at a congress where he is actually celebrated and lionized but the, the, the account in, in that one should draw in cold blood is that this is his great defeat. Um, and ever since Romanticism is considered uh, 
escapist, uh, apolitical, uh, vacuous, uh, uh, um, and, and really in um, working in favor of a reactionary uh, project of, 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 of privileging uh, the, the past over the present. Now, this changes um, gradually only in the late 60s and the early 70s, and the great ally of the re-legitimization of the Soviet engagement with Romanticism is the Soviet discourse of world literature. And now Pokoyeva, and you can read some of her work in the Routledge uh, uh, Companion to World Literature, uh, who was an, a specialist on Shelley and, and uh, English Romanticism, but was a real comparatist, who also wrote on Petrify and Mitzkevich and so on. She dug out for, uh, for the Soviets that famous passage in the Communist Manifesto in which um, Marx and Engels talk about world literature uh, arising out of the de-encapsulation of, 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 of disparate um, national literatures. And she pointed to her colleagues that the time Marx and Engels were envisaging chronologically coincides with what one tends to call romanticism. How could one possibly then disengage from the romantic tradition if it was honored by uh, Marx and, and Engels? So in other words, um, I really wish to make this point that thinking about world literature and thinking about national uh, literatures should not proceed in, in isolation because intellectually, um, and from the point of view of the history of ideas, these really are communicating vessels. And finally, I just wanted to um, maybe point to two or three texts uh, in case you wish to take this further. Um, the most important, methodologically speaking, article by Conrad. There is actually an English translation, uh, but it's so bad that I hesitate to recommend it. It's very uh, intelligible. And then uh, uh, an early statement of the methodology behind this multi-volume Soviet history of world literature by Yuri Vipper in English. Uh, Vipper was a, a, a comparatist uh, working mostly on Baroque and, and Classicism. And finally, a, a somewhat light-hearted but very readable account of Gorky's project in particular uh, in, in, um, in, in uh, French uh, by Jérôme uh, David, um, in case you, you wish to see the atmosphere of this desolate and hungry uh, Petrograd in which he manages, Gorky manages to persuade Lenin through Lunacharsky to set aside huge, a huge budget for this noble humanist mission of introducing the canon of world literature, European and non-European, to the underprivileged. I think I really should stop here with many thanks to all of you and um, in anticipation of the discussion. Well, this was quite a breathtaking journey to many <laughs> centuries and different continents. And I'm still a little dizzy, but I'm sure you have questions. And I don't know, Galen, would you prefer to take the questions yourself? Or? Uh, I'm happy either way. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot for yeah, an exciting talk. And I guess I'm taking further the discussion that we started in Moscow a couple of months ago, and that is world literature versus comparative literature, because what uh, Conrad is talking about, uh, this uh, history of genre moving through from century to century, from country to country, 
sounds very much like a comparative history of literature. I'm not sure, well, rather than world literature or and world literature. So uh, it looks like a zone of neutralization be seen alike, or what, yeah. what, what do you make out of that? Uh, you know, uh, comparative literature uh, institutionally uh, never took off in the Soviet Union. Because, uh, but, but we'll return to the point whether beyond its institutional, failed institutional life, the, how well this discourse failed. But uh, uh, tragically, as you know, comparative literature in the Soviet Union was always docked with this uh, anti Semitic prejudice that it is the science of uprooted. Um, uh, and, 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 and this passionate, uh, uh, for some even disloyal, um, uh, uh, interpretation of, of, of uh, various non-Russian uh, literatures. And it is very interesting when Konrad and Zhermonsky uh, write this uh, bid uh, to the Soviet Academy of Sciences that there should be a Soviet Journal of Comparative Literature. The Academy votes in favor, and then this bid goes to the Central Committee, and it just sinks somewhere in the corridors of power, and it never, never materializes. But to, uh, but back to Conrad, uh, you know, I don't think it is comparative literature, or certainly it's not comparative literature in the traditional way in which it was published. Uh, it, it was practiced all through the late 60s uh, or, or, or even the, the 70s, which really imagined uh, under this rubric of uh, comparative literature the uh, study of national literatures in their singular representative uh, languages uh, around also the question of uh, reception and, and so on. Um, uh, this discourse, uh, the Soviet discourse, is slightly different because the purpose is um, uh, the purpose is not comparison as such. The purpose is typology, and and this is a very different proposition, and it really is um, meto methodologically grounded in this Marxist Marist project of of a stagerism. In other words, um, uh, literatures, uh, how can you study them together? The only thing that justifies studying them together is the unavoidability of their consecutive transition through a set prescribed number of formations. And that is a slightly different project, just as Desiolovsky's project is not comparative. You know? Yeah, I guess um, in, in a Russian context, that's. Model yes, yes. I mean, you know, uh, Zhermonsky uh, self-consciously would call himself a comparatist. Mm -hmm. uh, and in many ways, uh, his work is really defining and, and, and seminal. But I still wish to, to insist on this methodological difference uh, here. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, thank you so much. That was just such a wonderful talk. And I'm just starting sort of my journey into Soviet literature at this time, so I'm really interested in what you're, what you're talking about. I'm just interested in your periodization of the three sort of epochs of Soviet world literature. The first and the third are both uh, scholarly or academic approaches to studying world literature, but the second seems a little bit disjunctive in the sense that it is a practical attempt to write world literature along with studying world literature. So this left orientation we talked about and its dissemination through, well, its attempted its dissemination through regime and through other writers. And I was thinking about, because what I've been studying is the way that um, certain international congresses, like the International Congress of Writers for the Defense of Culture in Paris in 1935, um, led to a dispersal of the Soviet model of politically engaged writing to places like India through the um, All India Progressive Writers Association and stuff. And I'm wondering, because that legacy is really important for Urdu writing and for a lot of world literatures. And I'm wondering whether that model of writing world literature persevered in the Soviet Union after this yeah. second epoch that you were 
Uh, this is a uh, this is a very good question, and it's a very good question. I think <coughs> uh, to begin with, for this um, reason that when we talk about world literature, we usually talk uh, about world literature as a secondary discourse that is produced by ways that are external to literature itself. And we forget uh, to uh, the fact that literature itself has its own ways of modeling world literature. Uh, sometimes very critically, as with Canetti, with the uh, Brendan Autodafe, uh, sometimes in ways that are very sour uh, and welcoming. Um, but that would, uh, uh, that would inevitably, particularly in the period you're referring to, uh, invite the question, uh, is there a, a poetic foundation to this variety of world literature which is committed politically, which is uh, in some ways class-based uh, and, and sometimes in a rigid way? Um, and I'm not sure how to, to, to answer this question. Socialist realism was meant to be the blueprint, uh, the unifying uh, poetic of this enterprise. Did it actually succeed in, in doing that? I think there are colleagues probably better qualified in this room to, to answer this question. In my uh, humble um, view, if it did, only at the price of inflections that would actually compromise its initial purity in the way it was conceived in, in the 1930s. So um, I, I think you would still find uh, in, in the 20s and in the 30s where this leftist vision of, of world literature which actually underwritten more by um, points that originate in outlook, in ideology, than in poetics as, as such. And the constraint of socialist realism, constraint in the sense of its capacity of becoming a global equity of transcending the European scene, was that it would actually construct a very European genealogy for, for itself. And it, this is what Lukács does. This is his uh, great enterprise of the 1930s, to go back to uh, mostly the 19th century, in part to the 18th century, and point to the great Western predecessor of, of, of uh, socialist uh, realism. So I don't know whether socialist realism really be, uh, becomes a global uh, phenomenon in, in this uh, uh, fashion in which the Soviets meant it to, to be. Um, so Margaret and then Kevin. Uh, thank you for the very compelling picture you've drawn of, especially, I was compelled by your story of the non-Eurocentric impulse at the core of the Soviet world literature project. Thinking now beyond the Soviet Union, do you trace a causal link or historical connection between that non-Eurocentric impulse and later movements to provincialize Europe and decolonize the canon in um, the Euro-American literary sphere? Uh, the direct answer is no. Uh, because uh, Conrad is virtually unknown uh, outside uh, Russia. And uh, to what extent he is still being read in Russia, I, I would doubt even that. Uh, there is. Uh, a Russian, uh, an English translation produced in Russia, a bridged translation of this important collection of articles called uh, West and, and, and East of 1966. But as I said, it, it is so 
bad that it's very difficult to make uh, sense uh, of it. Uh, one person who has read uh, Conrad uh, recently is uh, somebody who, uh, who is one of the very few, I think, uh, real specialists on Chinese Soviet literary uh, exchanges and on the knowledge of the Chinese of, of Russian literature, Mark Gamza. He's written on Conrad a little bit. But um, it's a little bit like uh, Said. Um, uh, Said, uh, of course, in Orientalism, uh, quotes a very important Russian uh, scholar, uh, uh, the translation of his book uh, into French of 1947. Uh, but, um, but there is a, a factual disconnect between Orientalism as a, as a discourse, which we recognize to be a Western intellectual discourse, and its predecessors in uh, not even the Soviet Union, but pre-1917 Oriental studies in, in uh, Russia. So I think this is sadly also true of, um, of this entire um, uh, set of ideas um, that uh, seeks to see world literature as a, as a project of asymmetric interaction. Um, just as the Central and Eastern European project at that time, a little bit earlier between the two world wars, which refuses to peg world literature to modernity, is unfamiliar in the West. And, and this has consequences because we are depriving ourselves uh, at our imperial of very powerful tools to, to think world literature in, in an alternative way. Yeah? Kevin? Uh, Galim, thanks for a great talk. Um, I was really struck by this sort of claim, and I think it's kind of convincing that these various projects that you identify are working towards articulating some kind of a, you know, a version of global literature which is inclusive of non-Western places in a more emphatic way than many other projects of the 20th century do. Um, but I also had this sense that if you, you know, go to any intelligentsia, you know, some bookshelf in the late Soviet period, you're going to find a very Eurocentric set of books. Um, that if you go back to the, the, the original you know, publications of Simeon and I and Tratura, um, it's going to be predominantly European literature with some representation of various other things as well. Um, but then I would be interested, like, who was actually reading the non-Western uh, stuff? So there's like a, there's a, um, a kind of an inertia of a Eurocentric canon. Um, and I'm wondering if you can give us a narration of where that inertia is located in the uh, cultural and institutional life of the Soviet Union. Right? I mean, certainly, um, if the USSR had been thoroughgoing in approaching, for instance, education um, or publishing in a completely non-Eurocentric way, we would have a different picture at the end of the, of the era. Um, well, so, you know, where is the, the resistance to these models located? Um, and how is the tension between this, uh, you know, these projects with their intentions and the actuality of, you know, school curriculum or uh, an intelligence and culture which is focused on uh, still, you know, the recognizable canonical structures um, of, a, of a Western Canada. Yeah. So how does that play out? Yes, thank you, thank you. I, uh, on the on the audience of non-Western literature, I was reading Rosson's book uh, in, in, in manuscript, and I think he can give a, a much better answer. And he does make this point which is your point, too. I think I got it. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that uh, which was very uh, sobering, that despite uh, the huge print runs, mm -hmm. uh, the educated Soviet public and the cultural elite was very lukewarm, and, and this is a delicate way of putting it, uh, <laughs> towards uh, non-Western literatures. And I think uh, you're absolutely right to, to ask where this is uh, uh, coming from. Well, um, 
I'm not going to go into this um, very reliable but somewhat predictable answer that a lot of this is driven by uh, uh, the logic of Cold War competition with the West, where the, the real target is, 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 is the West. Uh, the competition is not with China at the time. Uh, the competition is not with uh, India. It is with the West. What I'm going to say instead of that, and I think this is in a sense more important, is that uh, the, 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 the deep foundations of all this, I think, uh, are to be sought in uh, the domination of the Marxist ideological and cultural project. Because uh, what we tend to forget with reference to, to the Soviet Union, and uh, sometimes, um, I ha sometimes I have to, to say this in, in, in Moscow on occasion, <laughs> we, we, we tend to forget that um, in, in terms of intellectual history, Marxism, is a Western uh, product. Mm -hmm. and, and this is extremely uh, important. Because for all the uh, modifications uh, at the hands of, uh, of, of the Soviets, uh, this uh, uh, logic, which is um, momentously prospective of a movement towards a perfect society, which is somewhere in uh, in, in, in the future and, and which redeems uh, uh, a whole um, uh, uh, history of, of uh, dependence and, and, and enslavement and uh, uh, estrangement and exploitation. Uh, this uh, discourse, which is very uh, Western, uh, uh, which is in some ways also in debt to uh, enlightenment views of politics and society, it really, I think, prescribes the, the limits of genuinely going beyond uh, a non-Western uh, view of, 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 of culture and of its progression towards presumed perfection. Um, and I, I, I do think that, uh, in that sense, uh, the parameters were set, and how much one could go beyond that, even when it was not inspired by Marxism, uh, was not evident, far from evident. Amy. So I just had a, a quick question. When I traveled to Turkey and interviewed some people who were teaching kind of world lit in, in the 90s. Um, they really featured Russian formalism, uh, and they saw it as an, in a direct line. So I guess this goes back to the question of the Congresses indirectly, because I'm wondering, OK, maybe it's not a Soviet model of world lit that's exploited, but there is a Soviet kind of Soviet model of world criticism mm. that's exported and has this global currency. And, and is taught in many, many places. And it isn't necessarily nationalistic, but it is kind of anyway. I yeah. mean, it's attributed yeah. to, you know, kind of a, the Russian school of Protestant. And then and the linguistics thing complicates that into Eastern Europe as well. Yeah. So. No, I, I, uh, I fully agree with that. And actually, I was at, at Oxford on Friday at a workshop on the global genius of theory, and there was a talk from a colleague from Argentina. And she said how in, uh, already in the 60s, uh, the Russian formalists and back then were being read in Argentina in Italian translation, uh, above all. But I, I, I think that there is uh, this very important connection between Russian theory, and of course, you, you cannot nationalized theory, but you can talk about the Russian uh, duration of theory, and world literature, and uh, which we don't, which we refuse to think about, partly because liberal discourses tend to uh, 
to bypass their premises or to naturalize their premises. And um, so this entire idea that uh, you can read literature in translation and it is legitimate to do so and to analyze literature read in translation, which many of us think um, it has its, its own, uh, not just limitations, it's, it has its own negative political effects, as you show in your own uh, work so well. Uh, this idea, theoretically speaking, uh, comes precisely from Russian formalism, from one wing of the formalists who believe that literariness, that which makes literature literature, is portable beyond uh, the way it functions in a particular language, the language of writing. It is recognizable just as much in the language of appropriation, which is not the language of the, the original, but the multitude of languages in a translation. And I think this is the core project of modern theory, to think about uh, how um, the validity of what we say about a piece of, of, of literature uh, transcends the characteristics of the, uh, of the one and singular language in which it is written and speaks to a language which is estranged from that singularity and functions as multiplicity, which is only available in, in translation. So yes, there is an inherent connection there. And I, I still think we don't spend enough time thinking about the premises of this entire liberal discourse of world uh, literature. Yeah. And that is a political question, too. Yeah. And maybe the last um, question from Anna. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, so a question from someone who works on 19th century Russian literature. Your genealogy of Soviet world literature thinking was fascinating. And am I right that? Not a single line goes back to 19th century Russian thought. Is there anything Russian about Soviet world literature thinking? Anything at all? You know, uh, uh, the 19th century, uh, as you know better than me, is 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 full of, of Russian accounts of what the Russians at the time called either semi-man literature uh, or uh, uh, universal literature. Uh, uh, there is a, a sea of change, however, uh, because the 19th century, uh, these 19th century accounts, they're very much in the tradition of this first meaning of world literature that I articulated, which is static, encyclopedic, uninterested in dialogue and its asymmetries, and uh, yes, really very much proceeding in this uh, very serene yeah. and slightly misplaced belief that these are um, artifacts that are safely available for appreciation and um, for engagement uh, with. And there is a difference after 1917, uh, an appreciable difference. But yes, in the 19th century, the Russians participate in this question. Um, discourse on, on world literature uh, very much and on Western principles too. There is not yet a stake that this should be a non Eurocentric uh, vision of world literature. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, not one, but several questions, but I probably should not be standing. Um, between you and the food, which is just next door. <laughs> Galik has taken us far and wide across centuries, you know, food, which is a truly encyclopedic talk, so I suggest we, we thank him and then proceed to have flight today. <laughs>